Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and in this video I want to talk about modeling instruction, a relatively new way of teaching science. First of all, we should define what a model is. A model is a simplification of something in nature, so we can study it. So it could be a globe, which is a model of the Earth. It could be a DNA model. It could be a mathematical model, like the equation of pH. It could be a diagram or even a simulation. So models have been used in science classrooms forever, but the way they've been used in instruction is starting to change. In a typical classroom, the teacher stands in the front of the classroom, like I did for years, and presents students with a model. Or here's a molecular model or a diagram. In modeling instruction, we flip that whole mode of instruction. Instead of standing up in the front of the classroom and giving them a model, what you do is give the students an experience. You show them a phenomena, or you give them an experiment to follow. And then you fade out of the way, and the students are going to construct their own model. So if we think about what a model is, we all have a model in our head of how we think science works, and these students do as well. But if it's locked away in your head, and no one else can see it, we can't have a discussion about it. And so in modeling instruction, what you're doing is taking what's in your brain, the student's brain, and getting it out so that we can have a discussion about it. Now you might say, Modeling instruction seems like it's going to quickly descend into chaos, or how do you know the kids are going to go in the right direction? That's the role of the teacher and the other students in the class. Through questioning and questioning each one another's models, you can actually come to a much better understanding of the material. You know a classroom has a modeling teacher in there if it's just filled with small whiteboards. And you should go over some basics as far as whiteboards go with your students before you drive in. Um, first of all, you should tell them that pictures are going to be way better than words. You want to show people what you're thinking. Um, if you have arrows, that's a great way to show a matter or energy, but you should label it and colors work well. And then I teach my students the, uh, the power of a zoom in bubble, especially like in chemistry and the physical sciences. I'll draw a zoom in bubble that shows me what I can't see with a naked eye. So maybe I'm showing atoms, for example, on the inside. And so the way I do this in the classroom is I think you should start individually with each of the kids exposing their own model, especially when we're doing some uh, observing some kind of a phenomenon. The easiest way to do that is just each have a whiteboard or even a, a sheet of white paper. I like to have them, once they've kind of developed their own model, I like to have them work into groups. Like groups of three work really well. And then if we have time, from here we could go into a whole class model. We're bringing all of those ideas together. And that's something that's great to put like on the wall in the classroom. So let's model this. If you've got a sheet of white paper, I would encourage you to use it. So we've got a little bit of steel wool right here. It has a mass of 28.86 grams. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat it up. Generally, I would do this in a crucible in class. So I'd heat it up so the students can see what's going on. I don't know if you notice that, but there's going to be a qualitative difference in the color of the steel wool once we flame it. If anything falls off, I would then collect it in the crucible. And so now my question to the students is, do you think the mass has gone up? Do you think the mass has gone down? Or do you think the mass stayed the same? And so you should do that right now. Do you think the mass went up, hold your thumb up, down, or stayed the same? So you have to commit to an answer. It's a big part of modeling instruction. If you just wait for me to tell you the answer, you'll just say, oh yeah, I agreed with that. So is your thumb up, down? Where is it? Well, the right answer is that the mass will go up when we heat up steel wool. And it's kind of non-intuitive. About a third of the kids will generally think it's going to go up, but most of them don't really get that. And so now what do we do is I give each of the students a piece of white paper and I say, show me a model of where that mass is coming from. We all observe the mass increasing, so show me where that mass comes from. So here's a number of middle school students, each of them drawing models of what's going on. You first of all want to expose what you're thinking because that's literally what's in your brain. You're getting it out on a piece of paper. Now, in a perfect world, I would like to work individually with each, each of those students. And so let's say this is a pretty simplified model of what's going on. So now I would use questions to start to understand what this model is. And when I'm questioning a student, I always start with a, a compliment. So I would say, I really like how you have the steel wool plus the flame. I can clearly see that this is a flame. You've org organized it in, into some kind of an equation, and the flame looks very flamey, so it's really, really good. And then I'm gonna to start to dig into the model itself. My goal as a teacher is not to tell them the right answer. I wanna focus their understanding so I know that what they're thinking. So I might say something like this. I see that there's something black here. So is that the mass? I would wanna know where the mass is coming from. A lot of students will think the mass is maybe coming from the flame itself, or sometimes they'll think it's coming from the air. Sometimes they'll think it's a change in density. I don't, I don't want to tell them the answer. I just want to clearly understand what they're thinking. And when you're doing modeling instruction, that's what you want to do. I want to understand what each of the kids are thinking, 
before we come together. And that's why it's important to do it individually first. They, they want to bring all those ideas together. Now, in a perfect world, I would talk to each student, but you can't do that in a classroom. So you put them in a group, and in the group, they ask questions to the other members of their group. Once they understand what all three of them think, then they work together on a shared model. So here's some shared group models. You can see that the group model is much better than the individual model. This group came up with this idea that maybe the mass is coming from the carbon, and they even have a zoom in bubble where they're showing where the carbon shows up. This group came up with this idea that the mass is maybe coming from the oxygen. The key thing for me as a teacher is I don't want to tell them the answer. They, as they work together, the models are going to get better and better and better. And what comes out of this is investigation. So how do we see if it's carbon or it's oxygen? And as we come together as a classroom group, the models get even more powerful after that. This is a fourth grade class, and the students are making really wonderful models. Um, one of the things we're learning about science education is way down at the lower elementary, kids can make elaborate models. We just have to not explain to them. We've got to listen to what they are saying. Now, another way to do modeling instruction is just through experiments. And so when I taught physics or learned physics, I learned Newton's second law. A better way to do that through modeling instruction is just give them a modified Atwood machine and say, I want you to tell me the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration of the cart. They should gather a bunch of evidence and they should take that and put it into a mathematical model that they could deploy elsewhere. And so as we think about modeling, the first step is to do some experimentation. Uh, after that, we develop a model understanding that once we deploy that model, there are going to be problems with it. So we have to do more experimentation, and over time, we improve the model over and over again. Now, some science teachers I know, this is all they do, modeling instruction. For me, I'll do units where I'm just doing modeling instruction, and then I'll flip to another mode of instruction. If you want more information on this, it was kind of developed down at Arizona State, but I would point you to the American Modeling Teachers Association. They've got a lot of material and questions, but they also do training. And so that's modeling instruction. I hope that was helpful.